Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha channel. I am Swati Solanki working as assistant professor at Faculty of Law University of Delhi. I am taking up the course titled as White Collar Crimes and in today's session we will be discussing the Food Safety and Standards Act uh, 2006 part 2 wherein we will be discussing about authorities enforcement and prosecution under the Act. The objective of today's session would be to understand the functions of the authorities and the committees under the Act and to understand the regulation and enforcement under the FSS Act 2006. In the previous session, we did refer to the overview of the organizational structure given under the FSS Act starting with its apex body which is the central agency called as Food Safety and Standards Authority of India established under administered under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Now, since it's a central government agency, which is the food regulator, it is located in New Delhi with having its regional offices in the states like Delhi, Guwahati, Mumbai, Kolkata, Cochin, Chennai, Lucknow and Chandigarh. Now, it is very important for us to trace that what are the functions of the authority and the same can be found within the provisions of the Act. I have tried to compile all the relevant functions of the authorities. Now, first of all, it frames the regulation to lay down the scientific standards to ensure that the food that we consume is safe for consumption. Now, FASAI formulates these regulations under Section 92 of the Act. Now, after having identified what are the scientific standards with the help of the scientific committees and panels. Once these regulations are being formulated, they are placed before both the houses of the parliament under section 93 to have the force of law. It also provides the accreditation for the laboratories for testing the food. Please have a look at th point number three and four. It talks about the accreditation of laboratories and it provides scientific advice and technical support to the central government and state governments in the matters framing the policy and rules in which in areas which have a direct or indirect bearing of food safety and nutrition. Now, the most important aspect in here is that the food regulator continuously keep collecting and collating the data with regarding to the food consumption and incidences and prevalence of biological risk, contaminants in food, residues of various contaminants in food products, identification of emerging risks and introduction of rapid alert system. Now, it is based on three-folded system that it reads the market and identifies that what are the risks in the market regarding any food product that exists. It analyzes, which is called as risk analysis, then it does the assessment and then it communicates the risk. For an instance, when uh, food from the Europe was imported, it was contaminated with E. coli, which can be life-threatening, and it was immediately communicated to the public at large. Now, when we further talk about what else it does, it has its information network across the India, and it has various instrumentalities in that regard. If you look at point number seven, it does conduct training programs. Anyone who is interested in starting the food business and who is involved in the food business. It also contribute to the development of international technical standards for food, sanitary, cyto, phytosanitary standards. And when we talk about what are the international standards, in the previous session, we talked about the Codex Elementarius Commission. Now in there, there must be around 4,000 food items for which these standards have been provided. Whereas when we look at India, we have 377 vertical standards for the different food items. And then lastly, it creates, it promotes general awareness about food safety and the food standards. Now, when we talk about what are the two arms 
or food safety in laying down the standards. These are the scientific committee and the scientific panel. Now, if you look at this bullet point, scientific committee is constituted by the food authority under section 14 of the FSS Act. It has six independent experts and the members who are the member of scientific committee, they are not the members belonging to the scientific panel. So somewhere when we come across situations like that we do not have any working group or any panel for a particular food item, this scientific committee can formulate the working group looking at the emergent situation. Currently, it has a strength of 27 members. Coming to the latter part of it, uh, scientific committee acts as a link between scientific panels and the food authority. One example can be taken in today's scenario that when we talk about the sweeteners that are being used for beverages, we are talking about the artificial sweeteners. So India is at a stage wherein they have uh, formulated the scientific panel looking at the Indian context that what is the harmful effect of consuming these artificial sweetener which is alleged to be carcinogenic in its nature. Now if we talk about scientific panel, we have 21 scientific panel which have been constituted under section 13 and in total 21. So we have vertical uh, panels and then we have horizontal panels. So we can look at that for a particular food item commodity, we have vertical standards. For instance, if we are talking about milk or products which are milk based products, so that is one of the listed panel. And within milk, that what is the limit of the additives that should be there, that is the horizontal standard for which we may refer to the 2011 regulation. Now, this is the official website and it is the government website which is available for the open access. You can see on the screen that we have 21 scientific panels starting from food additives, pesticide residue, antibiotics. In the previous session we had given the example that animal feed is being injected with the growth hormones and the residues of the same can be found within that body of the animal that humans consume. So the limit has been prescribed in the nature of maximum residue limits. And if you can see further, for instance, fish and fisheries product and the latest have been alcoholic beverages, packaging, spices and culinary herbs. Now moving on to that what are the authorities that exist at the state level, section 29 becomes relevant for us. Section 29 provides that at the state level for the enforcement of Food Safety and Standards Act, we must have state food authority. Now, who is the individual who will be heading this state food authority? It is the Food Safety Commissioner provided under Section 30 of the Act. Now, you can see subsection 3 to 29, the authority shall maintain a system of control and other activities as appropriate to the circumstances, including public communication on food safety and risk, food safety surveillance and other monitoring activities covering all stages of the food businesses. Then we refer to section 6, the commissioner of food safety and designated officer shall exercise the same power as conferred on the food safety officer and follow the same procedure specified in this act. Now, when we talk about the enforcement of Food Safety and Standards Act, like under CRPC, we have the police officials. Likewise, under FSS Act, we have the food safety officer, which is commonly known as food inspector. Now, this subsection provides that, that the state authority level officer can also exercise those functions which are being exercised by the food safety officer. Now, what does it mean? It means that, that if the food safety officer needs to enter the premises, we need to refer the, what are the functions of this officer. Can this function be also exercised by the person who is chairing the state food authority? The answer is yes. He can also enter the premises and for the purposes of inspection. Moving to section 30, Commissioner of Food Safety of the state. Now, who appoints the Commissioner of Food Safety? The state government shall appoint the Commissioner of Food Safety for the state for efficient implementation of the food safety and standards 
and other requirements as laid down under the act and the rules and regulation made, made there under. Now, subsection 2 becomes very important that what are the functions that he can really exercise. In the case of versus Nestle Private Limited versus Food Safety and Standards Authority of India 2015, the company in question was alleged to have been selling the products in which the lead content was found to be beyond the permissible limit. Now, if you look at what is the nature of the food item in this case was, it was the noodle cake and the masala ingredient that was found under the packet. Now, nine variants of the company were being tested and it was found that in eight of the variants, the ninth one was not approved by uh, the FASAI authority. So, in the aspect, in respect of the ninth variant, no license was secured. So, speaking of the eight variants of Nestle, what happened in that case was that while applying for the license, because for noodle cake we did not have any standards, so it would automatically fall under the definition of proprietary food for which we do not have standards. While they applied for food approval, the lead content that was declared, it was very less what has been notified by the FASAI under the regulation of 2011 which is 2.5 part per million. Now the major, the contention here was that what limit is to be followed, what they declared in their product approval or what was specified by the way of regulation under the FSS Act. Now in this case the court has said that when we look at these regulations these are having the force of law because these regulations are being made under section 92 and then they are laid before the parliament under section 93. So to say that that FASAI was not going to follow its own regulation but going to follow what was declared in the food product approval form that is not the correct interpretation of law. So ultimately what happened in this case was that the declaration on the packet of the variants in particular the Maggi product, it was written on the packet no MSG salt contained. Whereas when we talk about the ingredients in the packet, there was in fact the lead content was found. So the direction was given to Nestle that please remove this declaration and the product would be relaunched into the market again whence it is assured that the product has complied with all the regulations given under the FSS Act. So nothing happened in this case because uh, when we look at the number of samples that were collected, it was found that in more than 80% they were complying the law. And then later on Nestle had filed a, filed a suit against the FSI that it was the process that was done against them causing the loss to the reputation was incorrect before the consumer forum. So when we talk about in that particular case, uh, FASAI had put the nationwide ban, the question in that case was whether it has the power to put a nationwide ban. The court in this case has actually tried to see that where does the power lies with the FASAI, if at all they could put the nationwide ban. So in that context, this provision is very, very relevant, which says, the Commissioner of Food Safety shall perform all or any of the following functions mainly prohibit in the interest of public health uh, the manufacture, storage, distribution, sale of any article of food either in the whole of the state or any area or part there of such period not exceeding one year as may be specified in the order notified in this behalf in the official gazette. So what do we see here that the prohibition order can only be passed with respect to one state or maybe a part of the state. It nowhere says that this prohibition can be extended to across the nation. Also, this order is to remain valid for a period not exceeding one year. So if SI wants to continue this uh, prohibition, then they again need to notify this prohibition order. Then carry out the survey of the industrial units engaged in manufacture or processing of the food in the state to find out the compliance by such units of the standards notified by the food authority for various articles of food. Then it also conducts and organizes training programs for the personnel of the office 
कमिश्नर ऑफ फूड सेफ्टी ऑन अ वाइडर स्केल फॉर डिफरेंट सेगमेंट्स ऑफ फूड चेन जनरेटिंग अवेयरनेस ऑन द फूड सेफ्टी एंड देन इट आल्सो इंश्योर्स एन एफिशिएंट एंड यूनिफॉर्म इंप्लीमेंटेशन ऑफ द स्टैंडर्ड्स व्हिच इंश्योर्स ऑब्जेक्टिविटी अकाउंटेबिलिटी प्रैक्टिकेबिलिटी ट्रांसपेरेंसी एंड क्रेडिबिलिटी now comes the important part that the food safety commissioner is the authority who will give the sanction for prosecution in regard to prosecuting the food business operator for the offences which are punishable with imprisonment under this act such other functions as the state government may in consultation with food authority may prescribe now comes the other part that food safety commissioner by order delegate subject to such condition and restriction as may be specified in the order such of his power and function under this act as he may deem necessary or expedient to any officer subordinate to him so what it provides that the food safety commissioner can delegate his function to his junior except for two things that are the power to appoint designated officer except three things that is except the power to appoint designated officer food safety commissioner and food analyst so for the appointment of these three different officers it is only the food safety commissioner who can discharge this power now when we talk about at the state level when we look at that who is that person who gives you the license for starting your food business it is the designated officer so section 36 talks about that now who is this person he must be an officer who is not below the rank of the sub divisional officer and he is in the charge of the food safety administration in such area as may be specified in the regulation now the functions have been laid down under subsection 3 as i said he is the licensing authority to issue or cancel license of the food business operator now let's understand this with the help of the example when we go to any restaurant we come across that the food license has been put in any conspicuous place which can be read easily now it contains the terms of the license and the license number let's say some food business operator is not complying with the standards as laid down under the act the designated officer can cancel his license to continue the food business b prohibit the sale of any article of food which is in the contravention of the provisions of this act and rules and regulations made there under to receive report and samples of articles of food from food safety officer under his jurisdiction and get them analyzed this provision is very very relevant for us in order to understand that how samples are being collected from let's say a shop from any manufacturing unit or industry it is the food safety officer who will then have to send the sample to the designated officer moving on further then it will he will make the recommendation to the commissioner of food safety for the sanction to launch the prosecution in case of contraventions punishable with imprisonment and he his he himself is the sanctioning authority for launching the prosecution in cases of contraventions punishable with fine now he has to maintain all the records which are made by the food safety officer and action taken by them in the performance of their duties now coming to the food safety officer that is section 37 who is commonly known as food inspector now he must have the necessary qualification and the food safety commissioner after having that necessary qualification it is the food safety commissioner who is going to appoint this officer now what are the functions that he is going to perform that has been provided in here the food safety officer may take a sample of any food or any substance which appears to him to be intended for sale or to have been sold for human consumption or of any article of food or substance which is found by him on or in any such premises which he has reason to believe that it may be required as evidence in the proceedings of in proceedings under any of the provisions of this act or the regulations or order made there under then he is been empowered to seize such article of food and to keep such article food 
and to keep such article of food under his safe custody now sometimes it may not be possible for the food safety officer to collect or to take in his possession the entire lot of the food item now in such circumstance what can be done so to overcome this situation what has been provided further in the proviso that the food safety officer will get security bond executed what is the security bond that this person who is the food business operator has to sign the security bond of the equivalent amount to the food item they may, that must be kept in his possession so let's say the goods worth of rupees 10 lakhs are been found in possession of this food business operator which have expired and therefore it is now unsafe for human consumption and the food safety officer has found this food business operator not complying with the provisions of the act now it is very difficult to take the whole consignment in the into the possession so the food business operator will ask please sign the security bond to the equivalent amount of the goods that you have in this possession now why it is been done to make sure to secure that the goods are not being destroyed if that happens then the equivalent amount which is mentioned in the security bond can be forfeited at the behest of this food business operator and for this the security bond may be signed with the sureties right so when we look at where the rule has been provided we can see that if we look at the rules pertaining to the food safety and standards act rule 2.3.2 sub rule 2 form 4 talks about the surety bond now continuing further uh when food safety officer is entering any premises and collecting the sample he will have to obviously then tell the food business operator that this is for the purpose of sample analysis when the food safety officer is doing so he will have to pay the cost for that food item now a few years back in jammu and kashmir it had come to the news that food safety officers were lifting the samples without paying the cost for it and the argument that was coming from that side was that when they purchase these when they lift these samples of the food from the market they have to place the requisition order before the authority that is there in place and because of the procedural delays these officers are never paid the amount which they had paid from their own pocket to the food business operator so because of these technical glitches and the procedural delays food safety officers were alleged to have been picking the food samples without paying for it but you need to understand that this is the statutory requirement under the provision now when we say that food is of perishable nature that by the time it is taken for the analysis it may destroy in the transit in such a situation the food safety officer is allowed to destroy the same at the point of inspection and this power has been given to him under subsection 4 of section 38 so you can see when he is doing so causing the same to be destroyed which is perishable in nature he will have to give a notice in writing to the food business operator now this is the procedural safeguard that we see here saying that the food safety officer is not unnecessarily harassing the other person so sometimes we see that food safety officers have made vexatious search or search which is not in accordance with the rules as prescribed under the act such food safety officer may be fined under section 39 of the act now looking further under subsection 6 when it comes to adulterant that has been found in the possession of the manufacturer distributor or dealer in any article of food or in the premises occupied by him and he is unable to account for it to the satisfaction of food safety officer then the same may be seized by the food safety officer and a sample of such adulterant should be submitted for the analysis to the food analyst right so this is an important aspect 
Now coming to subsection 8, where any books of account which was seized under subsection 6 in regard to the adult rent which becomes the documentary proof now. The documents seized under subsection 6, food safety officer shall within a period not exceeding 30 days from the date of seizure return the same to the person from whom they were seized after the copies thereof or extracts thereof from as certified by the person in such manner as may be prescribed. So when we are making the copies of the document, it has to be certified by that person. So in case if he doesn't certify, then what happens? The document shall be returned to him only after the copies thereof and extract therefrom as certified by the court have been taken. So we have provided a solution in that uh, context. Now coming to subsection 9 where any adulterant is seized under subsection 6. The burden of proving that such adulterant is not meant for the purpose of adulteration shall be on the person from whose possession such adulterant was seized. Now again it tells us that this is these are the strict liability offenses wherein a legal presumption is going to be raised against the person. However, it is not conclusive presumption. He may disapprove this presumption by leading the evidences that particular item was not intended to be used as an adulterant. Now coming to the part where samples are being analyzed, we are looking at another official who is being appointed under section 45 and that is the food analyst. Again, the commissioner of food safety appoints such person and such person should not have any financial interest in the manufacture or sale of any article of food, right? Now, what are the functions of food analyst? Now, let's say food safety officer has collected some samples and from that sample, one part is sent to the food analyst for the testing. Food analyst will also get a specimen of the same product. He will compare the two samples. One is the specimen and the other one is the sample. Now to ensure that both are in sync, he will also make sure that the seal is not broken, right? So he will compare it with the specimen and he will also make sure that the seal is not broken. That is provided under subsection 1. Now after having done so, what he is further required to do? We refer to the proviso in here, provided that in case a sample container received by food analyst is found to be in broken condition or unfit for analysis. Then he shall within a period of seven days from the date of receipt of such sample inform the designated officer about the same and send the requisition to him for sending the second part of the food sample. So designated officer usually keeps two samples with him. One is sent uh, to the laboratory for the testing and the other one is kept as a reserve in a case it has been destroyed in the transit if a case like where the seal is broken when the requisition is made before the designated officer he can release that separate sample. Now after having so the food analyst shall cause to be analyzed such sample of article of food as may be sent to him by food safety officer or by any other person authorized under this act. Now when we talk about other person authorized under this act, we did refer to section 30 wherein we said that the food safety commissioner can also exercise the function of food safety officer. So is he being authorized to do the same function? The answer to that question is yes. Now within the 14 days of having received the sample, he then needs to do a particular thing which is provided under subsection 3. The food analyst shall within a period of 14 days from the date of receipt of any sample for analysis send where such sample is received under section 38 or 47 to the designated officer for copies of the report indicating the method of sampling. Where such sample is received under section 40 a copy of the report indicating the method of sampling 
and analysis to the person who had purchased such food article of the food with the copy of designated officer. Now, what is happening here that under the Food Safety and Standards Act, we have authorized officer, which can be food safety officer who can collect the sample. But a private individual like you and me can also go to the shop and inform the food business operator that I want to pick certain samples because I want to have the food tested. Now, again, he needs to inform the food business operator and he can then send the food for the testing that is called as food sampling analysis. Now, that is being allowed under section 40 of the FSS Act, wherein a private individual, meaning he is not some officer, he is a common person, he can also have the food analyzed. Right. So, in that case, if the sample was coming from the way of section 40, the food analyst will also have to inform this purchaser. So, the purchaser can have the food analyzed. Now, imagine that you are not happy, the food business, sorry, uh, let's say you are not happy with the results. Do you have any remedy to file the appeal against that order? Then under subsection 4 says, an appeal against the re report of food analyst shall lie before the designated officer who shall, if he so decides, refer the matter to the referral food laboratory as notified by the food authority for the opinion. Now coming to the sampling and analysis part, when food safety officer is collecting the sample of the food, he has to give the notice in writing to the food business operator. The food safety officer will collect four samples. Why, do the, why does he do that? We will just have a look at it. Now, these four samples must be marked. It must be properly sealed with the signature or thumb impression of the person from whom these samples have been collected. Now, wherein where this person refuses to put his signature or thumb impression, in order to overcome a situation like this, the food safety officer may call witness one or more than one from the neighbor and have them sign or put their thumb impression on these samples which have been collected. Now, out of these four samples, one is sent to the food analyst two samples are sent to the designated officer. We just discussed that why does he keep two samples? One as a reserve just in case the sample gets destroyed. And the remaining part of the sample is to be sent to the accredited laboratory. Now, who gives the accreditation? We have NABL which is provided under. We have to, re we have to read this under section 3 clause P together with section 43. So, we have accredited laboratories in place which have proper mechanism to test a particular element, right? And the accreditation certificate is given by this National Accreditation Board for Testing and Calibration Laboratories. Now, the intimation when the samples are being collected have to be sent to the designated officer. Now, one sample was sent to the food analyst and one sample was sent to the accredited laboratories. Sometimes it may happen that the result of these two reports of the lab or of the food analyst are at variance. They are not same. There is a some difference between these two reports. Now, what happens then? The designated officer can send one sample that he had kept with him to the referral laboratories and that report shall be final as written here. Now, when we talk about that when the sample is collected in regard to the food or adulterant, the food safety officer on the immediate succeeding day has to send those sample to the food analyst where the sample sent to the food analyst is lost or damaged, designated officer shall send one part of the sample to the food analyst on the requisition request made by the FA 
that is food analyst or the food safety officer. Now, when we talk about food or adult trend, they have not been destroyed on the spot by the food safety officer. The same shall be produced before the designated officer as soon as possible and in no case not later, not later than seven days after the receipt of the report from the food analyst. And when we are talking about or referring to the food that has been imported in question, this is to be sent not later than five days. Now, coming to the prosecution part of it, the prosecution can be launched under section 42 and we refer the food safety officer shall be responsible for inspection of the food business, drawing sample and sending them to the food analyst for analysis. The food analyst after receiving the sample from FSO shall analyze the sample and send the analysis report mentioning the method of sampling and analysis within 14 days to the designated officer with the copy to the commissioner of food safety. Now the designated officer will figure out whether it is the violation in contravention of the rules which are punishable with simple fine or which are punishable with imprisonment. If it is the former case, he will sanction for the prosecution. If it is punishable with imprisonment, then it has to be sent to the food safety commissioner for getting the sanction and the same thing has been provided under subsection 3. But subsection 3 also talks about one thing that the recommendation shall be made within 14 days to the, uh, we need to refer to subsection 3. The designated officer after scrutiny of the report of food analyst shall decide as to whether the contravention is punishable with imprisonment or fine only and in the case contravention punishable with imprisonment, he shall send his recommendations within 14 days to the Commissioner of Food Safety for sanctioning the prosecution. Now when we talk about what are the codes that we have under the Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006, you will find that the ordinary civil court has no jurisdiction because we have constituted the special court under the Act. Now let's have a look at subsection 4. Now the Commissioner of Food Safety shall, if he deems so fit, within the period prescribed by the central government as per the gravity of the offence, whether the matter to be referred to a court of ordinary jurisdiction in case of offences punishable with imprisonment for a term up to three years. So up to three years, the matter can be referred to the ordinary court. But offence is something which is violating a provision that is punishable with more than three years. Then the matter has to be referred to the special court as given under clause B. Then if we look at subsection 5, the Commissioner of Food Safety shall communicate his decision to the designated officer and the concerned food safety officer who shall launch the prosecution before the court of ordinary jurisdiction or special court as the case may be. And in case the sample was coming from the person who was the purchaser of the food item, the same shall be communicated to him also what has been the decision under this subsection 5. Now coming to the compliance part of uh, the rules and regulations under the Food Safety and Standards Act. Section 23 talks about packaging and labeling of foods. Now this is relevant for us because this becomes the ground where we can pick up any food item and look at the packet and decide whether this manufacturer or food business operator is engaged in unfair trade practices or not. So what are the things that are being provided in here? That no person shall manufacture, distribute, sell or expose for sale or dispatch or deliver to any agent or broker for the purpose of sale any packaged food product which are not marked and labeled. So we are just going to refer to the regulation in the context of packaging and labeling of food. So as you can see on the screen, Food Safety and Standards Labeling and Display Regulation 2020. Now when we look at any food item, we say that the item needs to clearly declare providing all the information regarding this food product to the consumer. 
Sometimes we do see that a food packet may have brown mark. You can see it here. Sometimes we see that the green mark has been provided. Now when we talk about these marks, these are important to declare if the food is non-vegetarian or if the food is vegetarian. So we must think that what are the regulations which have been provided and where they have been provided. So we see that FASAI by passing of the regulation of 2020, it mandates that all the food business operator must comply with this. So your food product that you consume, it must come with all these declaration. Then the packet should clearly have the FASAI license number. Now you see this mark that is a box with a cross inside it. Sometimes items are being sold in the market which are ordinarily be consumed by the public at large but it has a different purpose. For an instance products which are being used for ceremonies, religious ceremonies that are not intended for human consumption. So to declare that this product is not for human consumption, this mark has to be used by the food business operator who is manufacturing some this food item. Now the, the place where we say that this declaration should be there, it is called as the principal display panel means the part of the container or package which is intended or likely to be displayed or presented or shown examined by the customer under normal and customary condition of the display. Sale purchase of the food article contained therein. Now whatever you see here and here, all these marks of declaration have been used by FASAI in their 2020 regulation. So if you want to refer the same, you can look up. Now coming to the part wherein we are referring to the unfair trade practices given under section 24. Now advertisements are basically informing the consumer that what they are going to purchase, right? Sometimes they exaggerate the qualities of the food product which can be misleading. Now we may see that for these unfair trade practices, we have another remedy to go under the Consumer Protection Act of 2019, specifically after within the definitions of the Consumer, of Consumer Protection Act, within the terms of services, the food has also been included. Now these two agencies, the food regulator that is FASAI on one hand and the Central Consumer Protection Agency work in tandem with each other. Now we had seen a few years back that in regard to the case of honey, it was found that honey is being adulterated with sugar syrup. Now the Central Agency, the Agency under Consumer Protection Act sought the response from the FASAI that they need to constitute the panel taking the relevant steps in the directions to regulate the supply, manufacturing and the sale of honey in the Indian context. So what we are saying here that unfair trade practices are being also taken care of by the FASAI. Now what does FASAI do? The minute it comes uh, across any news like this, that this product has been sold, which is substandardized in its quality, the FASAI can pass the order that you must withdraw your advertisement from the market. Now, moving on further, if your advertisement falsely represents that the food are of a particular standard, quantity or grade composition, makes a false or misleading representation concerning the need for or the usefulness gives the public any guarantee of the efficacy that it is not based on an adequate or scientific justification thereof. Now, moving further, the penalty for the misleading advertisement is provided under section 53, wherein if the advertisement falsely describes any food or is likely to mislead as to the nature or substance or quality of any food or gives false guarantee that person shall be liable to the penalty which may extend to 10 lakh rupees. Now when we are talking about that what are the standards that the food safety 
that the food business operator must comply with the responsibilities have been enumerated under section 26 he must ensure and the language that has been used here is shall every food business operator shall ensure that the articles of food satisfy the requirements of this act the rules and the regulations made there under at all stages of production processing import distribution and sale within the businesses under his control no food business operator shall himself or by any person on this behalf manufacture store sell or distribute any article of food which is unsafe which is misbranded or substandard contains extraneous matter or for which license is required except in accordance with the conditions of the license so all these ingredients have been discussed in the previous session for which the penalties have been also discussed now continuing further no food business operator if he is suffering from any infectious contagious or loathsome disease he must not engage in the any of the processes that may be involved in the manufacturing or supply of or sale of the food item now looking at the liabilities of manufacturers packers wholesalers and distributors and sellers one may refer to section 27 if the manufacturer or the packer of any article of food is not complying with right if the manufacturer or the packer of an article of food is not complying with the rules and regulations prescribed under this act he shall be held liable for the same then when we look at subsection 2 it refers to the wholesaler or the distributors and fixing the liability upon them so if the food is supplied after the date of its expiry it is stored and supplied in violation of the safety instructions of the manufacturer or is unsafe and misbranded it is unidentifiable of the manufacturer for whom the article of food have been received or it has been stored or handled or kept in violation of the provisions of the act or rules or it is received by him with the knowledge of being unsafe in such a situation the wholesaler and the distributor can be held liable now coming to the seller part if he is selling the food after the date of expiry handling the food in unhygienic conditions or it is misbranded again you cannot identify the manufacturer and he receives the product being having the knowledge the product being unsafe then the seller shall also be liable now moving to section 28 which talks about food recall procedure you must remember the nestle maggie controversy wherein the company had made a declaration on the news channels that they are withdrawing their product from the market unless the misunderstanding has been clarified now when this controversy arose the fasai had put the nationwide ban but before this ban was being put they had already communicated about the future course of action to the nestle uh, india limited now in this case one must look at what section 28 provides that what is the procedure that needs to be adopted in case where the manufacturer feels that the product which has been circulated in the market needs to be withdrawn from the market that aspect is provided under section 34 and we have to refer to section 28 as well section 28 talks about the food recall procedures and section 34 talks about the emergent order for which show cause notice has to be served now looking at subsection 1 if a food business operator considers or has reason to believe that a food which he has processed manufactured or distributed is not in compliance with this act or rules or regulations made there under he shall immediately initiate procedures to withdraw the food in question from the market and the consumers indicating reasons for its withdrawal and inform the competent authorities thereof now this is the initiative which is taken by at the behest of the food business operator where he believes that it is not safe for the human consumption 
vary as when we talk about emergent prohibition order given under section 34 it is the fasai that takes the initiative now when this food business operator has some reason to believe a concrete reason that food must be withdrawn from the shelves in the market they must cooperate and provide assistance to the authorities under the act and in this regard subsection 2 becomes relevant a food business operator shall immediately inform the competent authorities and cooperate with them if he considers or has reason to believe that a food which he has placed on the market may be unsafe for the consumers now after this what we had previously discussed that the food regulator that is the fsi also in up in addition to laying down laying down the scientific standards they also analyze the risk manages the risk and communicates the risk as well so as soon as the risk is been identified in the market the regulator will take swift action and in this regard subsection 3 becomes relevant the food business operator shall inform the competent authorities of the action taken to prevent risks to the consumer and shall not prevent or discourage any person from cooperating in accordance with the act with the competent authorities where this may prevent reduce or eliminate a risk arising from a food and they must follow the guidelines as prescribed under this act now i was talking about the emergent prohibition order which is provided under section 34 the heading says emergency prohibition notices and orders now there are some statutory safeguards in place which are the principles of natural justice if these principles are not been followed it may suggest that there is some ill intent on the side of those who are enforcing this act against the food business operator uh, this act tries to strike the balance between the enforcement on one part and the food business operator on the other part now please have a look if the designated officer is satisfied that the health risk condition exists with respect to any food business he may after a notice served on the food business operator in this act refer to as an emergency prohibition notice apply to the commissioner of food safety for imposing the prohibition now what is important in here that the designated officer who is the authority at the district level if he comes to uh, the, to the knowledge of the fact that there is some health risk condition existing he will immediately serve the notice upon the food business operator now simultaneously he will be informing the food safety commissioner about this because when we talk about putting the prohibition in one part of the state or the whole of the state it is the food safety commissioner who can impose such a prohibition that we had read under section 30 of the fss act now subsection 2 says if commissioner of food safety is satisfied on the application of such an of officer that the health risk condition exists with respect to any food business he shall by an order impose the prohibition so this is in sync with what we had read under section 30 now comes the procedural safeguard under sub subsection 3 that is the designated officer shall not apply for emergency prohibition order unless at least one day before the date of the application he has served notice on the food business operator of the business of his intention to apply for the order now this is the procedural safeguard that exists that you must serve one day notice upon this food business operator in mercedes nestle india limited how this company had won the case apart from the merits that were existing are also the procedural aspects now in this case nestle was not served with the notice but prohibition order was first passed and one day later the notice was served and the court that is the bombay high court had said that this is a statutory safeguard that is available and it must be complied with now continuing with subsection 4 as soon as practicable after making of an emergency prohibition order the designated officer require the food safety officer to serve a copy of the order on the food food business operator of the business or to affix a copy of the order at a conspicuous place on such premises used for the purposes of that business 
any person then if he knowingly contravenes such an order shall be guilty of an offence and shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to two years and with fine which may extend to two lakh rupees. Now, when we talk about that, till what time this emergency emergency prohibition order remains valid, subsection five is relevant. An emergency prohibition order shall cease to have effect on the issue by the designated officer of a certificate to that effect that he is satisfied that the food business operator has taken sufficient measures for justifying the lifting of such order. Now, what is important? It will continue to remain in existence unless and until the designated officer is satisfied that the food business operator has taken measures in complying with the provisions of this act. So what happened in the Nestle controversy was that the Bombay High Court, after giving the decision saying that, that you must remove no MSG salt contained from the package, another additional direction that they must manufacture the new lot and from the new lot, the parts of the sample will be sent to the accredited laboratory only and until this uh, authority is satisfied that the new compliance has been made the product is not going to be relaunched until then. Now, it is one interesting provision that is section 35, which mandates that the medical practitioners, if they come across any news of food poisoning happening in their area, they must inform the occurrences of such food poisoning to the authority that is the at the state or the district level. Now, lastly, we had made a reference that section 89 overrides all other laws, even though it may be consistent or inconsistent. So we had referred to one case that once the prosecution is initiated under IPC and also under the Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006, it is the latter that will prevail over the former. So we have tried to encapsulate all the relevant provisions relating to the Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gillette Sam uh, and I teach uh, sociology at IIT Kanpur. Uh, today I am going to tell you about uh, the different characteristics uh, of the movement of things uh, around the world that are associated with globalization. Uh, we refer to these kind of movements as global flows. Now, um, the concept of global flows uh, is quite important and it's important for us to understand the uh, different ways in which these flows might occur. Now typically uh, when people talk about uh, the movement of uh, things from one place to another in, uh, in the context of globalization, uh, they're under the misconception that things tend to flow uh, from abroad into the place where they are living. Uh, in a, in a very sort of st stereotypical manner, uh, there is this idea that with globalization, much of the movement that occurs is from Western countries into non-Western countries. Now, uh, as sociologists, we know that uh, actually global flows are multidirectional. So, which means that as much as there is a movement of flows from Western countries into non-Western countries, uh, there is an equal amount of movement uh, of flows from one non-Western country to another non-Western country and in fact uh, a movement of flows from non-Western countries into Western countries as well. Uh, Let us take the example of food for instance. Uh, you may be aware of uh, a type of food uh, which originated uh, 
actually in China and then goes on to Japan, uh, called ramen. Uh, for instance, uh, the popular brand Top Ramen that is consumed in India is an example of ramen. 